Hey, welcome to Fathering Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegrift, and I'm not the perfect dad, but every day I am trying to be better. I am joined today by a great friend of mine. He's the pastor of Truth Church in Denison, Texas. His name is Darren Gilbert, and Darren had to get himself and his family through a very challenging storm. His wife was diagnosed with leukemia. The doctors didn't give them much hope, and uncertainty was all around. He joins me today to share his story. You could tell that mom wasn't there. Yeah. And uh, I would try, you know. We had, I mean, I had girl conversations, you know, all those kind of things. Um, it, it just was not normal. If you're a dad who wants to embrace your God-given mission, make sure you subscribe to Fathering Our Future wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also get more content on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you want even more than that, then head over to www.fatheringourfuture.com. Well, buddy, thank you so much for being with me, man. Yes, sir. I'm excited about it. Yeah, I know... uh, I've been hounding you for too long to be on the podcast with <laughs> it's me. All right, um, may, might have been a little insensitive of circumstances, but no, you're good, man. Um, I I honestly think that you're one of the most sincere guys that I know. I I, I tell that when people talk to me about you, when they're like, you know, what do you know about Darren? And I always tell them, I always tell them this. I was like, that's the most sincere man I know. <laughs> um, this you are. You're 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 kind. You're giving, and you're always looking out for others best interests which yeah. is um it's probably a really good trait since you're a pastor yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably so <laughs> not a jerk. that's probably on the checklist somewhere <laughs> yeah yeah that's 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 great but uh you have a remarkable story i mean you have you you've been in ministry for the majority of your life mm-hmm. um you've always been faithful you've always preached to people about being faithful yeah. Um, but a few years back, you started down this path of where you really had to start practicing I did. being faithful. Um, your wife was diagnosed with leukemia. Mm-hmm. And at that time, y'all had four kids. Four kids. Very brave. Yes, one four. on two. Right? Uh-huh. You're, you're doing it. Um, so you had four kids. You are pastoring a church, which, mm-hmm. you know, I know we'll get into that, but you found out. Yeah, that you're going to be pastoring the church shortly thereafter. Mm-hmm. So you've got all this that's just like weighing on you. You have so much uncertainty, and I'm sure there's lots of moments of hopelessness. Even though you're yeah. clinging to hope as For a Christian, sure. as a person of faith. Uh, but let's just let's just go through the story. So okay. life for you is. I'm going to go ahead and just say it's picture perfect at that point. It was very good. It's very good. I think you and I were serving on the team, so it had to be great. Yeah, that's right. I was I was really involved it's, in your life at that point. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so so life is good. Yes. Um, but your wife is experiencing some issues. Mm-hmm. So what were some of the initial signs where she's like, "I need to go get this checked"? Okay. Well, we were actually at a general conference, and actually not to far before um, she found out we we're at a general conference and her feet were swelling. Well, me as a guy, I'm like, it's the hills you're wearing every single day, yeah. you know? And so, but it was way more than that. And she had had other uh, times that that happened, but at a general conference, it was horrible. Like she couldn't walk like to the point wow. where could not walk, had to take shoes off. I called Ubers and we made, we made the rest of the conference work, but it was miserable. Like she could, there were times she didn't want to go, brought her to tears, things like that. And so, um, on the way back, we're like, Hey, let's go get some blood tests. See what's going on. There may be a little issue that we need to get fixed. Whatever. I don't know. Antibiotics, something. I have no clue, yeah. but she went to the doctor. I can't remember the exact date she went to the doctor. Uh, all I do remember is when we got the call back, um, we were going to a church in a day on October the 19th, 2018. And we're driving by, um, as I, as I talked about with you earlier, um, driving by the medical city, not medical city. Um, Center for Family Medicine in Sherman. And as we're driving by, she gets a call. I'm on the phone with my brother-in-law and I get off the phone when I hear her say, oh, Jesus. And that's when Dr. Hodge, her doctor, our family doctor said, "Um, can you come in and uh, bring somebody with you when you come in? And so obviously, when have you ever been told that by a doctor? Sure. And I've I've been to the doctor many times (laughs) and I've never heard those words. Right. And so me being a, a man, a dad, a husband, it's okay. Chill out. Yep. I mean, she's completely to the 
what's wrong with me, what is going on and all these different things. And, um, anyway, um, we went in and that's when he said he's not a specialist, but all her numbers looked as though she had leukemia. Mm. And so we went through that weekend. I mean, that was on a Friday. We didn't go to the event, the church in the day event. And on, on Monday, like we uh, knew that we were going in, but we didn't know when. And so if we got a call early Monday morning that said, we need you to go to um, medical city on Onc- oncology right here in uh, not medical city, but um, oncology hospital right here in Sherman. And so she was a specialist, went in and this is exactly how it happened. We walk in, we meet my mother in the parking lot to pass off our youngest at the time. There's, there's a lot of them. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to remember which one it was. One yeah. of the four. <laughs> Yeah, it was Quinn. It was our youngest. And so we drop her off and we go in and obviously she's crying. Where are you going? All this kind of stuff. Well, while we're there, the doctor, which I cannot remember her name, unfortunately, but um, she said, you do have leukemia Hmm. for sure. And you need to go to medical city, Dallas right now. So like she makes a phone call and we get in the car and we drive to Dallas and that began her uh, chemotherapy that night. I mean, it was like, it was probably the worst time of our lives. When did it actually, when did it settle in for you that this is, this is actually happening? Cause I mean, I understand as, as a man, yeah. I mean, I've never, you know, thankfully never had any issue with, with my wife to where I had to yeah. think, yeah, it's not going to be that, but there still have been other complications where it's been like, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. Like, yeah. I understand that. Mm-hmm. But when, when did it actually hit you? Like, this is real. Like, I can't just say this is okay. It did not, it did not hit me until the chemotherapy started taking, started affecting her. Gotcha. So like we were in the hospital and they started us immediately. Like we went through, we had to go through emergency, um, get in the room, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was pretty fast track, but for some reason we had to check in the emergency room. I don't remember all the reasons why she wanted to do that. The lady here, but we did that, got in the room fast. And before the sun went down, she was taking chemotherapy. And while she was taking it, like horrifically sick. Mm. And then I realized then that, Hey, this isn't like, we're going to put a bandaid on it yeah. and be okay next week, you know? And, uh, doctors came in and they're saying terms and I'm like Google and I'm trying to figure, st- I don't have a clue. I mean, right. I don't have, I don't know what's going on. And so I'm like, I'm Googling all this stuff, looking at all this stuff. And anyways, man, it was, uh, that probably didn't help. No. And I'm not the guy that does that. My wife does that. Yeah. She Googles everything. I told her to stop, but he was saying things that I didn't have a clue. Right. You know? And so I knew that I was going to, I, at this point, I'm not even thinking about anything except I told my mom, don't scare the kids. Yeah. Because, I mean, sometimes she has a tendency to do that. And so I was like, don't scare the kids. Just let them know we'll be back later and all this kind of stuff. Well, there was not going back later. I did. Yeah. I, after she went to sleep and I had to go get clothes for her, clothes for me, all that kind of stuff. And had to figure out what I was going to do that week. You know, like I'm the pastor. What am I going to do? You know, yeah. who, who's going to speak on Wednesday night? I don't even remember what happened, actually. I don't know who was there. Um, it might've been Chad flowers. I don't know. Um, anyway, so that's when it hit me. That's when it really like slapped me in the face. When I saw my wife getting sick from what you only hear about people going through, Yeah, you know, they're, I oh, you hear about so-and-so went through chemo. Well, I didn't know what that meant. Right. You got to that's see some it. jacked up stuff yeah. just to be pretty blunt, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you talked about, you know, not wanting to scare the kids at that, at that point. At that point, you had four. You have mm-hmm. five now, mm-hmm. which that's a great part of the story that we'll we'll okay. talk about. <laughs> yeah. But you had four at the time. What were the ages? Um, eighteen. Um, I get you a calculator. If that's you right. No, it's all right. <laughs> 20, it's twenty three right now. My oldest daughter is twelve. So okay, so take she, off five. So she was seven. She was seven. Okay, and that would make uh, Tate. He was six, and okay. Creed was four, and Quinn was like okay two. So your oldest two, six and seven, mm-hmm. probably could understand to some extent. I mean, especially yeah. being at the church all the time. Like yeah. I'm sure you've had funerals and I'm sure they kind of yeah. understood enough. I know my six-year-old to some extent has, got a story about has an understanding, story. but well, you could tell the story. But I want to know at what point did you have to make the decision 
I probably need to tell my kids. Like, there's a chance. Well, that we did that weekend. So okay. We we and it was a uh, and it, it it might get me messed up, but uh, anyway, my oldest daughter, <clears throat> she had a <clears throat> pardon me. At the time, she had a friend uh, in school. All of my kids, they knew this young man um, that had cancer. Okay. And so he had no hair. And so when we made the statement at at the dinner table, we were eating at our house. And we wanted to tell him, hey, listen, we don't know um, what's going on. We know that mom's got to go to the doctor on Monday. Uh, Most likely, we don't know when. Uh, Don't get scared. But mom could have leukemia. Well, my oldest daughter, like, screams, no. And she's, like, thinking about her friend. And, uh, man, that, that messed up Ginger. That messed up me. I was like, I'm trying to, nobody's seeing it, you know. Right. But I'm like, my heart's like, oh, my God. And I'm like, what in the world? And so I'm, we all cry, we pray, and it's, it seems to be okay. But we yeah. go, we're going through the weekend, you know, we're going into Sunday and everything's fine. Obviously, I'm trying to, in my brain, trying to figure out what I'm about to preach. If I'm, yeah. what, am I, what are you going to preach? You know, this <laughs> just got hit in the face with this. Do you preach faith? Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> what do you do? You know, right. But, uh, and to be honest, I'd have to go back and look. I have no idea what I preached on that Sunday. But, um, Anyways, it was, uh, that was pretty hard. And so from that point, things, they went to school that day knowing that we would probably go to the doctor, mm. but we, like I said, we didn't know when, and they had, they got picked up by Nan and Poppy and we weren't there. Yeah. And so you can imagine what that did to them. Like, I mean, I don't know exactly. I know that my daughter was scared half to death. Sure. You know? And my son too, Tate, my oldest son, he was. But they were really, they were still kind of young, where so they still played and had fun, got to stay right. with Nan and Poppy and right. things like that. But things were a little, little rough. You know, that week they kind of struggled in some in school. Right. I mean, they struggled in grades, and I mean, we we found out later, you know, that because we got the report, or I did, and I was like, "Dude, what's going on?" You know. Yeah. And it's because they were just trying to function. Yeah. You know? Rightfully so. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, you know, and looking back. Is there any advice? I know there's probably not an overwhelming majority of husbands or dads who are going to find themselves in this same situation, but there are going to be some. Yeah. Um, But in the case of having to tell your kids Mm -hmm. like this traumatizing news. Yeah. Was there anything that you did? Is there anything, you know, reflecting back on that maybe you would do different potentially in order to help your kids understand or cope with that or normalize the best that they can? You know, the, I, I really, I thought about that stuff as we went into it. And so I, I don't know if there would be, um, maybe if I could keep them in their home, that's one thing we didn't do. Okay. Um, we sent them to, it was easier on my parents. Uh, but I wish that they could have stayed in their home like yeah. while we were doing what we had to do. You sure. Know? But in telling them that we, we thought about that and that, that's cause we had no idea we, at that mo- at that present moment, we didn't have a clue, right. you know? And if I, if we would have waited, I think it would have been worse because they would have been like, what's going on? Yeah. You know, why is mom and dad not here for, I mean, we we're a solid week, you know? Right. I mean, that I, I got to come back. She didn't get to come back, you know, but, um, that was the whole time I told Ginger, I said, baby, I'm going to be here, but let's try our best to do whatever we can. Let me try our best to keep it as normal as possible. So when I could go back, I would go back and I would yeah. have the kids and I would take them to school. And then I would go, I'd drive to, I mean, I could drive to Medical City, Dallas and park in the parking lot with my eyes closed, you know, because yeah. <laughs> I really could. <laughs> but that's just, I mean, so telling them, man, I don't, I think what we did was probably the best with the situation that we had. I don't know if I, I didn't want them to find out from someone else. And sure. I didn't want them to find out like if we were gone. Yeah. And because there was an uncertainty of that Monday, we didn't know what was going on. And they didn't even, they didn't even give us like an idea that we could go to the hospital. Yeah. You know, we just walk in and wait in the waiting room. We're holding Quinn and then my mom comes and gets here and then we go in the back. Gotcha. And then the next thing it is, we're going to Dallas. Right. I mean, literally did not even get to go home. Was there ever a time with your kids where things somewhat normalized for them? No. It was just always it was up in the air, chaotic, it, questionable. 
it was like they, um, you could tell that mom wasn't there. Yeah. And, uh, I would try, you know, we had, I mean, I had girl conversations, you know, all those kind of things. Um, it, it just was not normal yeah. until she was there, you know? And, uh, and I, I tried, you know, I, we, I cooked dinner, you know, obviously you can imagine you have three kids, like it got really crazy at times, you know? Yeah. And, uh, it kind of got normal. I say it didn't, it kind of got normal when, um, uh, I, I don't know if we want to talk about this now, but when we found out that the chemotherapy was not working, mm. um, because, um, she was resistant and wow. her body was resistant to the chemo. And so it was not working and couldn't get anything to work. And so that's when it got normal because during that time she was on chemo and they told us that she would be sterile. She was not. So, <laughs> <laughs> so obviously things got normal to somewhat, some yeah. degree, uh, but they, uh, she was not sterile. We found out she was pregnant uh, at one of her uh, appointments she went to at the oncology in Dallas. And uh, so she had to do what was called apheresis. And that was like, she had to go and her blood had to be done something to, to keep her oh, numbers wow. down. Cause if it, if her numbers didn't stay down, she would die. And wow. uh, um, that was the issue. Like with the baby, they were like, when we do this apheresis, there's a, a possibility that it could kill the baby or there's a possibility that um, uh, it could be malformed or whatever. I got you. And, so it, during that time, it kind of became normal because she was at home and we were doing everything like we always did. Yep. Um, she did feel weak, you sure. know, but um, that, that was the most normal time. But then it got to the point where she had to have something done and chemo was not going to work. And so we had to do a bone marrow transplant. And so oh. there was bone biopsies and there was, there was all the time she would feel weak. It's like after the feet swelling thing, which they still don't know why that happened. That's what sent us to the doctor. And we don't even know why that happened. Wow. Yeah. It was like a sign or something. <laughs> Who knows? That's insane. Yeah. But like during that short period, and I cannot remember the, t the times, but um, that short period of time, at least nine months, you know, right. Or it was a little bit earlier because he was premature, but um, during that time it was normal to some degree. And we had normal, normal visits to the doctor for a baby, like norm all that kind of stuff. And my kids kind of forgot about it, you know, if you will. Like they, they really did. It wasn't like, "Hey, mom, are you still sick?" Yeah. I mean, she was taken, but she was there. She was there in like a big old tray of medicine that she had yeah. to take and all that kind of jazz. And the the trips to apheresis, like I mean, I can't even remember all the times. There was like five hours that she had to stay and wow. do this little apheresis. Sometimes I would sit beside her. Sometimes I would leave. You know, I. I one time she went and that's when I found out that, um, uh, the conference that we have called youth Congress was mm -hmm. canceled that because of COVID and all gotcha. that. Gotcha. Uh, that's another thing. She got COVID during all this time. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, bro. That was, that was pretty intense. It's man. worse than I thought it was, man. Yeah. That was, that was the worst part of the whole thing. She got, wow. she, there was no way she could have gotten COVID because the doctor had told us she stays home and she comes to apheresis. Yeah. That's all she does or she goes to the doctor for, for the baby. And during all this time, like she got COVID. Wow. And, uh, she stayed at this hotel that we have right down the road and because none of us had COVID. And so I got her hotel room, stayed there. I had tons of points anyway. And so I was like, well, let these run out and I'll start paying whatever we got to do, you know? And, uh, anyway, man, she stayed there for like almost two weeks. Wow. Yeah. And, one day she called me, she's like, and I would, we, I was always there, you know, I'd go take her food mm -hmm. and all these kind of things. And, uh, um, I would open the door and look at her and she would just look like, no pun intended, but she looked death. Right. I mean, she looked warm. I mean, she would bathe every day and get up and open the windows and just be just completely, it was different than me and you having COVID. Sure. This lady was already sick. You know? Right. And, and she was also having to do these apheresis treatments and all that. And yeah. so. And anyway, and another thing I would probably have some of the timeline mixed, mixed up, but I know that that was the worst part. Like she had to go to the doctor and she was like, I've got to go. And like, she was, she, I was like, do you want me to drive? He's like, no, I don't want you to get COVID. So I'm like, I, I, I need to drive you. And she was like, you got to take care of the kids. And so I'm like, wow. I wanted to do it, but she didn't want me to do it. And so she yeah. drives herself to Dallas. And then she, oh my she was hospitalized 
for a month. Wow. Yeah. She was in the hospital for a month on a COVID floor. I couldn't go in. Wow. They would not let me come in. And so it was crazy. Celebrated her birthday. Like we were downstairs and had a birthday and wow. all that kind of stuff in the, on the parking lot of the medical city, of Dallas. It was crazy. Wow, that is insane, <laughs> man. I didn't realize yeah. how much it happened. I, I mean, I got COVID. COVID messed me up. And, yeah. and I, I was, I always tell people, and I was like the healthiest I had ever been in life. I think in the 10 days leading up to when I got COVID, I think I had run like 55 miles or something. Oh I was the most active I had ever been. And dude, that knocked me on my butt. That, my wife was gone, thankfully. Yeah. She had the kids. They were in Ohio. And I told her after the fact, I didn't tell her while I was there yeah. she had lost it. But there were a couple nights I was just like, God, if you don't keep me, I, I don't think I've got the strength to wake up. Like I, I thought I was going to kick yeah. the bucket a couple nights. It was, it was, it was, it was a weird experience, but I can't even imagine yeah. leukemia going through all the stuff, being pregnant, having to do yeah. extra because of that Yeah, and then get COVID. Yeah. That's, that's insane. How long did this last with her from the day you found out until October 19th till you got to a place? Cause now she's recovering. Yeah. Oh yeah. She's so good. When, when did recovery start? Recovery started in 20, um, at the end of 20. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. 21. Okay. 21. That's when it all real recovery started. Got it. So she's, uh, it started in 18, uh, October night, the 22nd is when we got the for sure diagnosis, um, for leukemia and it went till, oh man, she'll be upset with me for not remembering. I, um, for the bone marrow transplant, I used to be on social media and I used to have all this stuff, but, uh, anyways, it, it was 21 is when yeah. it all, the recovery started. Wow. And so it was a long time. Yeah. Three years, three yeah. years is a long time. I mean, geez, I mean, you just, you gave me about a two month window just, just yeah. then. And like, yeah. that's insane. And to think that that carries on for three years. And that came or not chemo, but uh, COVID and all that stuff was after the baby. You know, so like that was, wow. yeah, yeah. So that was wow, like, that's so she still had the pregnancy and apheresis and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. then we had, we had the baby and then she still had to do apheresis for a little while. And then she went into a bone marrow transplant and yeah. there was no match anywhere in the system. Couldn't find a match. Wow. And, uh, her sister Angel and her brother, uh, Anthony, they both went in to see if they were a match and they were both a half match. Okay. And they, they can do stuff with half matches now. Wow. And so they, um, our miracle workers, what we call him, uh, he was the miracle was Anthony, Anthony. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's AP. Is <laughs> you didn't have him. to tell everybody that. I know. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to even credit. register. I'm no. not going to take credit for that. <laughs> no, but, uh, Anthony Powell, man, if it wouldn't have been for him, she wouldn't be here today. Wow. Yeah. So she, he came to medical city of Dallas. They got all his, uh, platelets, all the good stuff and did all their, mumbo jumbo to it yeah then put it inside her and it just like that took about an hour and wow. it was not a bit really big deal um it's, I, it was a massive deal it just wasn't a big deal as far as them doing it sure they brought in a bag like they do blood and you sat there and watched it go into her body and that was it that was it that was it and wow and the the deal was after that is she had to start producing his cells mm. like so she they had to they had to mesh with her. And again, I don't know all the technical terms. If a doctor watches and be like, this guy's an idiot. Yeah. I, I am. So it's, this is true. So you're in good company. Yeah. Today, Darren. <laughs> so they like, they had to like mesh with her body. Like, cause all of her stuff was out and they had to, she had to start reproducing his cells. And that took a while. And yeah. There were some, there were some scary times during all that. And so, um, she was able to do it. And, uh, I say she was, her body was able to do it and things went well. And, she started producing 100% his cells. Oh, wow. So this is a kind of a cool thing. Um, she could commit a crime and blame it on him. It's pretty neat. Good to keep that in your back pocket, yes, you know? Yeah. I know, I know we just recorded it, but it's pretty neat. Like if you ever wanted to I'll do I'll burn something. the recording if you do it. You just tell me, man. This is why we're buddies. And be like, hey, listen. <laughs> she just murdered somebody. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no messing around. Again, he pastors in Denison, Texas. <laughs> 
No, but it, we make a joke about it all the time. Like you could get away with anything and blame it on Anthony. Wow, that's awesome. So. Well, yeah, neat little bonus out of all yeah. that. But yeah, man, that's insane. Three years of just wild chaos that oh, you was. went through. Um, you brought up the pregnancy, so let's talk about that. Which okay. I, I don't know if I should, you know, commend you for being able to do that in the midst of all that. But I it, can tell you what kudos, our doctor said. Kudos for trying. <laughs> <laughs> our doctor, our doctor told us that it was impossible. And so I asked him, I was like, how, what, what's the deal? And he's like, well, either you're a stud or we lied. And I'm like, well, we know. Yeah. I'm there, a stud. There you go. That's all there is to it. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm the man, you know, no, it's just joking. But it's a, uh, but that, it was just our little joke, you know, cause like, when he said that, I was like, Hey, I got you. Yeah. Dr. Bouchon. Yeah. There you go. Man. Stud. Duh. You know, it's yeah, not that you're wrong. You just didn't know who I was. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So anyway, wow. So that happens. Yeah. They have all these complications. Now their advice to you was to abort, correct? Oh, for sure. That's it. There was no other advice. Abort. The baby will be for sure. Malformed is, is like he, he came in the, in the office saying you need to abort this baby. And we were like, I looked at her and I said, no. And she was like, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And that's not even an option for us. And so that's when apheresis came in. And again, I don't remember all that that does, but it does keep her numbers to where they need to be. Yeah. Because if they go to a certain place, then she could die. Wow. And so that's why we had to do the whole, that was my fault (laughs) or our fault, (laughs) whatever. It takes two to think. Exactly. It takes two. (laughs) So, but yeah, that's, um, the, the whole time, every, even after we made the decision, there were times that she would go yeah, and he would, are you sure you want to keep the baby? You know, when, when it was okay to say that still, right. you know, for, uh, right. in the age that we live in. But, um, uh, after a little while he quit saying, just accepted that this is what we're doing. Yeah. And so she would, she'd go to her appointments, do her thing. And yeah, that was it, man. And you said he was premature, premature. So yes. was that natural premature or did you uh it was induce? natural okay it was uh not not natural i'm sorry it was uh induced okay we induced and the reason we did we were going in and uh the baby like i can't remember exactly what happened but um the baby was something was going on on the inside heart rate was dropping low and they had put a little thing on it on his head okay and uh so she was like we're doing this now so we were going to induce and so we didn't induce. We like actually had a C-section. Gotcha. And so he was in the NICU for a little while. And uh, um, we were actually, Youth Congress was coming up. And I was, Amaris was, I was on, still on the youth committee or whatever, yeah. still um, doing all that. And uh, I was like, we're not going to go, Ginger. And she was like, no, you need to go. You were taking Amaris. Amaris was going with us, both of us, okay. when all this kind of happened. So she was going to go to Youth Congress and we were going to come back. And it was going to be close to the baby being born, but all that kind of got turned around and Ginger was like, no go. Cause, um, uh, we, we had the baby, all that stuff happened and she got to go home and the baby was in the NICU. And so we were having to go back and forth at this very short little time here. And so I was like, no, I'm not going, I'm going to stay with you. And, and she's like, no, take Amaris. So I did. I took Amaris and, uh, Amaris got the Holy Ghost. That's cool. That was pretty cool. Yeah. She, it was really neat. One of her, a girl she met, um, one of the guys on the youth committee, like they were praying together. And so that was like wow. a, that she needed yeah. all of that to happen Yeah, because she was kind of, she had become, and this will get me messed up. Like she became like my right hand, like her and Tate, um, more so her. Cause she was trying to be older. She had to grow up a little too fast, you sure. know? but I wouldn't change it. You know, she's a great young lady and um, she helped dad a lot. She learned how to do all the laundry. She learned how to fold everything. She, um, there were sometimes I'd be like, "You got to do this. You got to do it now." You know, yeah. Don't don't do anything else. Do this. And sometimes I feel bad about doing that, you know. But at the same time, like I said, she's a she's a great young lady. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool that that yeah. came out of that process. Oh man, she has grown up though. Yeah, <laughs> she's yeah. twelve going on nineteen. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> more fun for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know what's what's cool about that is it takes a stud to make a stud. Yeah. You were told all this stuff about he'll be malformed and might not even make it. Mm-hmm. But little man's what three now? Three years old, and he is a rock star, man. That's cool. The coolest, and I, I don't, 
no offense, rock stars. He's better than a rock star. Yeah. He's cool, man. He's a 100% healthy, never a problem, no sickness, no like prolonged things. He's wow. already, he's not small anymore. He's, he's a little guy, but he's not small, you know, for yeah. his age. And I wouldn't change his little blonde haired, blue eyed boy. So, That's cool. Yeah. He's a, I, I always was blonde headed when I was a kid and obviously blue eyes. And he's a blonde headed blue eyed boy. And he's awesome. <laughs> Shoot, you might be the father of my children because they all turned out <laughs> blonde hair, blue eyed. I've never had any of that. Always dark hair, always <laughs> green eyes. All That's our kids awesome. came out were like, how do they all have blonde hair and blue eyes? Like, <laughs> I want to go on an episode of Mari or whatever. There you go. Anthony, you are not the father. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm just waiting for that day to happen. Uh, um, but that's I, I, that's that's such a cool insert into the story. Oh, man, in, it, in the midst of all of that, this happens, and then you see the result of it now. Yeah, I mean, you already know this, but you know God had His hand on oh, man. you and your family throughout all this. No doubt about it, man. Uh, my wife, she wanted to. She said, "I want to just name him. I want to name him like something that means something," you know, mm-hmm. and so. Um, we started looking around, trying to find a name, and so we we found it. We spell it a little different, but his name's Key, and it means warrior. Yeah. So that's a that was a cool little thing that we threw in there. He's he's a warrior. God God helped him. He helped us because it when he came, it like it still had helped heal. Mm-hmm. You know, it really did. Yeah. Even even though there was a little bit of bumpy road at the beginning, it helped heal. Yeah. And uh, touched. Um, I mean, after she had her bone marrow transplant, even the stuff after. There was a constant like wanting to see and wanting to talk to him. And it it gave, and she'll tell you this, it gave her motivation just to keep pushing. Sure. Not that her family that she had wasn't, but it right. was just even more so. There's a know? special bond oh, yeah. right there. Like she'll she'll say that like, you know, my my mother in law helped raise him. Like when my mom didn't have him, I did. And so I get to experience a lot of stuff that a mom doesn't get to experience like right after, you sure. know? So there was no, like, you know, a mom usually breastfeeds. There was none of that with right. this, with this son. And, uh, so she never got to experience some of those things sure. uh, cause she was in the hospital a lot, even after the, um, pregnancy, just with the bone marrow transplant and all that. But she'll say that it helped her, yeah. pushed her, motivated her. That's so, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. You talked about a little bit earlier in the interview here you talked about some of the chaos mm-hmm. that entered your personal life. Yeah. You're driving all over the place. You're trying oh, to yeah. take care of the kids. You're trying to figure out, I kind of preach Sunday. Mm-hmm. Like there's, there's a lot that was going on. Talk a little bit about the toll that this took on you, because obviously with ginger out, mm-hmm. I mean, you're taking up all the responsibilities in the home. Yeah. So what was that like? Uh, man, it was it was crazy because I mean I, I I was a bachelor for a little bit before we were married, and so I had my little mindset of what to do, and so I had to when you have when you marry someone, you have to relinquish some of those things mm-hmm. because they they're the woman of the house and want to do that stuff, and so I I had to like get back into that mindset, you know, of like okay, I'm going to do. It. I mean, there were times I do my own laundry and fold all the things, but sure. but not as much as she does. Yep. She's the hero here, yep. you know. And so I had to get into that. And I, like I told you earlier, I want to keep things normal. So I would either fix food. Our, our church was incredible. They had, um, you know, it's Uber Eats or Texas Home Delivery is what ours is called. That We have Uber Eats and all the others now. But at the time, we had what was called Texas Home Delivery. And so some ladies in our church helped us with that. And so there were times that I had I had meals, like yeah. whatever, I, whatever we wanted, we'd get and have it sent. Or I would cook meals or grill steaks or whatever. But I had to get into that mindset, like... I had to redo my time management. Sure. You know, I, yeah. I knew what worked for me only and uh, picking up kids or taking kids, but I had to do like all that different. Like, okay, I've got to do this and then I got to go to Dallas. I'm going to be there for this time. I got to come back here. I've got to study and I would just get up super early and I would study before any kids got up. I would do my devotion and then I would get all their stuff ready, either fix lunches or buy lunches or whatever. And I still don't know to this day, but some person, at our kids' school, um, informed us that we had like three hundred dollars worth of lunches bought, and so that was like the coolest thing ever. Yeah, that's you know, awesome. Like never. Uh, so a lot of these, you don't even think about it, but these little bitty things that helped you sure. immensely. You know, it was, it was incredible. And I had a friend named Drew Galloway. He would always ask me, like, "How are you doing this, man?" I'm like, "I'm only doing this because people like you, man, praying for me." I said, "I really do." You hear about the prayers of the saints, like really. 
that, that, that helped me. It motivated yeah. me. And, um, I felt that I know that's what it was. I don't have, I don't have any other, any me, I would like just completely <laughs> bail out and like curl <laughs> up in a ball and be like, what's wrong? You yeah. Know? But I didn't, I didn't do that. I just kept fighting, kept going. That motivation of when I was a kid and playing sports, I guess came in and I, I just made it work. You know, God, God helped me out most yeah. definitely. Um, and just managing time and, I'll just be transparent. There were times that I'd had enough, you know, like yeah. kids would argue and say, and I'd be like, listen, mom is sitting in the hospital and we're sitting here listening to this argument. Well, stop, you know, yeah. quit, quit this mess. You know, and I have to be a, a mean dad, if you will, for a minute, but sure. I had to do that. But that's the only way, man, I was able to do it is time management, prayer, and knowing that people were praying for us. I, I st- we met somebody just last week. Um, I can't even remember where we were. Oh yeah, I was at um, a graduation, uh, a little not a gra- it was a graduation and a, a awards banquet for some of our students, and we went to it. And a lady walked up to us and was like, "Are you Ginger Gilbert?" And she was like, "Oh my goodness, I followed you, I followed everything. I know there's not very much posted anymore. We have a page that one of our guys in the church it is to do things from not time to time, but we don't tell them to do anything anymore." But, yeah. Um, she said, "I prayed for you every morning." Wow. And like when you hear that, you're like crazy like we went to a wedding in ohio and uh uh, reese dillingham a young man that was an intern for us um and while we were at that wedding a a lady came up and the same thing are you ginger gilbert oh i remember seeing your story and we prayed for you and et cetera et cetera and so that's what i credit it to man sure being able to make it and I, i know that's the spiritual uh answer but it truly is i don't i mean it's what you can't downplay it Uh, you can't i mean it's what motivated me to um, preach what I would preach and say what I would say, you know, like when God would just quicken me and uh, give things to me to say while I was preaching and it, it would be the right thing at the right time for, yeah. for not only myself, but for others as well. So, so do this for me. Cause right. I, I want to talk about, I want to talk about what life was like as a pastor. Cause okay. you're, you know, you're working and you still have to still got to do your job, right? You yeah. can't, can't just abandon and jump ship wherever you want. But before we do that, for any husband, dad, maybe even in a sim- similar situation. Yeah. So just maybe it's not leukemia. Maybe it's not that big of a deal, but maybe, you know, they've got a month yeah. where their wife is down and out or away on a trip or whatever. And it's just them, yeah. the kids, and mom's not a part of the routine. Um, can you give any advice on how to manage, like how to get through that? good practices to implement man number one make things fun that's what i would try to do yeah i tried my best to make things fun like uh when they would ask about mom i would say hey she told me to tell y'all hi and sometimes anthony she not her she was even putting me talking sure she was like oblivious i mean i'll just this is one of the funny things that happened like but she saw small people because of ativan they gave her ativan and it messed her up really bad and so so i would I would tell her she, I was like, she, she told you hi and the little midgets or something like that, you know, <laughs> but yeah. just be being fun, but we would have fun and we would, we'd try to spend some time when I could spend time with them. We'd spend, we'd spend time together. Yeah. And I, um, so I would say do that and don't get frustrated. There were times that I did that I wish I could go back and fix those. You know, I really do. And I did uh, to an extent, I apologized and talked to him about it. And dad was, um, I was stressed and this is why I was stressed and I'm sorry. And don't do that. You know, like don't, act, don't react like that, you know, but what I would say is try your best to have fun in whatever you're doing and don't get overwhelmed. And that's say, I say that with tongue in cheek, it's hard to not get overwhelmed when your wife's in the hospital and you've got uh, four, five kids even um, at the time. And, but that's what, that's what I would say. You, you need to try in those moments to have a memorable moment that's more memorable than that one is. That's cool. And that's what we tried to do. Yeah. I mean, we did all kinds of stuff, man. We went places and I can't even, I'm trying to remember all the things that we did. We did a lot of fun stuff. You know, I took yeah. one place. I went, we went to the um, president's uh, museum yeah. uh, there in Dallas and just, I, I mean, I was dead tired, but I was like, no, let's go. Let's do this. You know? So we had, went and saw mom through the window. She was up top and then, we went down to the museum and that's cool. hung out and I tried to make little kids like stay together. Yep. <laughs> it was like my own little field trip. Yeah. You know? 
<laughs> but we did that kind of stuff and they remember it. And we ate, we'd go eat something nice, you know, I'd take them somewhere to eat nice. And then we'd go back home and I'd pass them off to Nana and then I'd head back. Yeah. You know, so, um, I don't change those or, 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 or wouldn't trade those for anything. You know, we had, uh, game nights and fun nights and, and then I would just, I would sit by their bed and talk to them. You yeah. know, some of them, not all of them would stay awake, but Amaris and Tate more so. Yeah. And then little Quinn, she would always want to know where mommy was, where's mommy, where's mommy. And, um, anyway, I, I built a, I built a relationship with them that I don't think will ever go away. You know, it's like, I've seen where as you get older, you distance a little bit. You, they're your mom and dad. Sure. But I don't know if these will ever go away. So, and I'm thankful for that. Yeah. And even more so when mom came back around when Ginger did, like they, they're connected, you know, and I love that. I don't see that everywhere. You know? Yeah. It's not an unhealthy connection. It's like they just love their mom and dad. That's so. awesome. So I, I don't know if that's good advice or not. That's but great that's advice, man. <laughs> Making it fun. That's, yeah. that's the Make way to go. Make it fun. Try to anyway. That's the, that's the way to go. What a story. Darren and Ginger went through so much, and there was a lot that Darren had to take on himself personally without the assistance of his wife. And what he's navigated has been immense, and it has been challenging, but it has been rewarding. And we're going to finish the rest of this interview next week. So make sure wherever you're listening to this episode today, wherever you're listening to Fathering Our Future, Go ahead and follow and subscribe. Go to fatheringourfuture.com. You can subscribe to the website and you'll get notified anytime there's a post, including additional blogs and other things of that nature. Subscribe because you don't want to miss next week's episode with Darren. But I want you to make sure that you have this takeaway from the interview today, and that is the power of prayer. Darren was moved and encouraged by the people who prayed for him through this storm. So just know that people are praying for you, that there's power in that prayer. But I also want you to flip the script, and I want you to realize this. When you pray for other people, it makes a difference. When you pray for your friends who are going through things that you're not going through, it means a lot to them, and it really does help. Prayer is powerful, it is impactful, and it works. Don't ever take that for granted. This is Fathering Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegriff. Thank you so much for being with me, and I hope you will join me next time. Thank you again for listening to Fathering Our Future. If this episode has served you or you believe it will serve another dad in the future, make sure that you leave a like, a comment, a review, or share this so that it can reach another dad. And so that you don't miss out on another episode, make sure you subscribe to Fathering Our Future wherever you listen to podcasts. And again, for more great content, head over to www.fatheringourfuture.com.